If the magnet designer is not careful, the magnetic field may cause a resonance condition, which has the opposite effect of focusing, and may cause the beam to blow up and be lost. In this episode, we intentionally design a bad set of weak focusing pull tips to demonstrate the Walkinshaw resonance. We recall from the previous Betatron Motion episode that only a small taper of the pole tips is necessary to create a sufficient magnetic field gradient quantified by the field index N to simultaneously focus the beam in the vertical and horizontal directions in what we call weak focusing. First, let us look at our good pole tips, which were designed by Carolyn Chun in 2001. The taper, which opens the magnetic air gap with increasing radius, causes the field index to start at zero at the center and grow positive. This becomes clear if we overlay a plot of the field index over a simulation of the good weak focusing pole tips. We note that the field index of n equals 0.2 occurs at a radius of 113 millimeters just inside the D wall and after interception by the deflection channel inlet. A semi-ion simulation of a distribution of protons launched slightly above the midplane shows the acceleration, the turn-to-turn -turn spacing, and radial and axial focusing. We experimentally demonstrate this through a long exposure image where we paint in the beam's motion. We clearly see the increased frequency of vertical oscillations with a reduced vertical amplitude, both of which follow from the increasing field index. And then finally, the beam coming to a nice spot. This is good focusing and what we would expect from a well-designed magnetic field. A quick review. The axial tune, nu z, is the number of axial oscillations per revolution in the machine. For our weak focusing field, this works out to be the square root of the field index. The field index dictates the frequency of axial oscillation. The radial tune, nu r, is the square root of the quantity of one minus n. For simultaneous axial and radial focusing, n must be greater than zero, but less than one. We saw in the previous video that for complete transverse stability in a weak focusing machine, the field index has to be greater than zero, but less than one. We've determined that nu z, the tune, is just simply the square root of n, and we've also shown that nu r is the square root of one minus n. So these two values are clearly coupled by n. So let's plot them against each other. We know that nu z at the beginning is zero because the field index is zero, and nu r is one because it's one minus zero. And we work our way up to the most where nu r is zero and nu z is one. We see that this curve is a circle, and we can write the equation of a circle in terms of nu z and nu r. So nu z squared plus nu r squared equals one, making the substitutions for n and one minus the square root of n, we get the square root of n squared plus the quantity of the square root of one minus n squared equals n plus one minus n, n's cancel out, equals one. And in the weak focusing cyclotron, the ion starts out at nu z equals zero and nu r equals one and climbs. Now we are ready to consider the situation of coupled resonances. We can write down the equations of motion in both the axial and radial directions. So we have z double dot plus omega squared n z equals zero, as well as r double dot plus omega squared times quantity one minus n times r equals zero. So we assume that the two motions are unrelated. For small excursions, this is typically true. We assume radial motion only occurs in the midplane and axial motion occurs on the radial equilibrium orbit. But a more rigorous analysis will reveal that they both have radial and axial focusing when departing from the midplane. And the equations of motions will have both R and Z terms in both the radial and axial modes of oscillation. If the axial and radial oscillation frequencies happen to be related, by small integers, it is quite possible for energy of one of the modes of oscillation to be transferred to the other and then back again. In principle, this is okay, since there is a finite amount of energy. However, especially in the case of a cyclotron, where there's only a small axial clearance, large radial oscillation amplitudes that are transferred to vertical would scrape the ion on the D and they'd be lost. This type of a resonance, where a fixed amount of energy can be exchanged between modes of oscillation are called coupled resonances, or also known as difference resonances, which can be represented by A nu z minus B nu r equals C, where A, B, and C are integer values, and of course, nu z and nu r are the tunes. Return to our 
circular curve and we draw a box at the integer value of one for both new R and new Z, we can draw lines that satisfy the low integer value for A, B, and C. We can see that these lines intercept the circular curve. The first one occurs at field index equals 0 0.2. The equation of that line is new R equals two new Z. The field index point of N equals 0 0.2 encounters a disastrous blow up of the beam and is called the Walkinshaw resonance. Because of the new R equals two new Z being a difference resonance, any error in the radial direction represents a finite amount of energy, which then if it's completely coupled into the axial direction, bounds the amplitude in the vertical direction. So we can calculate directly what that is. In what must be a first in particle accelerator history, we designed a set of bad pole tips to intentionally bring the field index of n equals 0.2 sufficiently far into the chamber to drive the Walkinshaw resonance. Before machining these pole tips, we performed a simulation to compare the beam's behavior with the good weak focusing pole tips, which is in the upper plot, with the bad weak focusing pole tips, shown in the lower plot. In the upper plot, we see nice betatron motion coming to a focus at the full periphery of the machine. However, in the bad weak focusing field, shown in the bottom plot, we see the beam start off okay, but when it hits n equals 0.2, the beam vertically blows up, scrapes on the D lids, and is lost, leaving no beam to make it to the periphery. The following semi simulations show a single ion accelerating normally and then encountering the Walkinshaw resonance. Its motion wildly whips between the axial and radial directions. This view shows the radial projection only, and depending on where you're viewing it from, on how big the turn-to-turn -turn spacings can become. Satisfied that this would work, we machined the bed pole tips. We horizontally scaled the 12 inch diameter pole tips to 10 inches, but kept the vertical scale the same. A quarter inch thick extension remains in order to bolt the pole tips onto the magnet pole pieces. The taper is now 21 thousandths of an inch over a four inch run. We remove the good pole tips, mount the bad pole tips, and install the chamber. Typically, we give extra attention to centering the chamber, but in order to observe the Walkinshaw resonance, the beam must start off with a radial error. We generate this by installing the chamber with a substantial radial offset. With the chamber reinstalled, let's pump down, turn on, and tune for beam. With beam on the screen, we draw the radial probe in and out to see if the beam blows up at some point. Sure enough, we see the focusing occurring, and then at a large radial distance, the beam greatly expands in the vertical direction, blowing up and hitting the lids. Let's zoom in, see the beam wander up and down, come to a nice focus, and then blow up vertically. Pull it out any further, and the beam is gone. You are viewing the effect of the Walkinshaw resonance. This is clearly observed when we perform a long exposure paint-in. We see the turn-to-turn -turn spacing, axial oscillations, a tight focus, then the catastrophic blow-up. Using a simulation with approximately the same conditions, initial radial offset error, vertical misalignment, etc., we can recreate the experimental observation. Any ion displacement from its equilibrium orbit is considered an offset error, which carries a fixed amount of energy in that coordinate. Let's consider the axial direction. If the orbit is stable, the ion will oscillate about the equilibrium orbit with an oscillation frequency of omega z. The ion reaches a maximum displacement of z max. And by taking the first derivative, we see that the ion crosses the equilibrium orbit with a maximum velocity of z dot max. From the first derivative, we can say that z dot max is equal to z max times omega z. Then the stored energy T sub z can be determined from the maximum kinetic energy of the equilibrium orbit crossing velocity, one half m 
z dot max squared. Make the substitution and t sub z can be written as one half m times z max squared times omega z squared. Rearrange to solve for z max, which is one over omega z times the square root of twice the kinetic energy over the mass. Remember from the Betatron motion episode that the tune is the frequency of oscillations about the equilibrium over the ion's revolution frequency, or the cyclotron frequency. We make the substitution and write Zmax in terms of the cyclotron frequency and the axial tune. We can write a similar expression for the maximum radial displacement in terms of the radial tune and error energy. Coupled resonances. Now, we consider a coupled resonance when the magnetic field configuration permits coupling between the axial and radial coordinates. We take the worst case scenario that there is sufficient ion dwell time in the resonance region for all of the energy of one direction to couple into the other. We can then determine the maximum transverse excursion for each of the directions when they each temporarily host all of the offset energy. Or conversely, determine the maximum stored energy of the coupled system when one direction's error is at its maximum. After a little bit of algebra, we see that the ratio of absolute displacement amplitudes is just the inverse ratio of their tunes. The Walkinshaw resonance is at a field index of n equals 0.2, where we know that nu r equals 2 nu z. Of course, nu r is the square root of the quantity of 1 minus n, and nu z is just the square root of n. We see that z max over r max is the square root of 0.8 over the square root of 0.2, which is exactly 2. This ultimately shows us that any radial or horizontal error amplitude is doubled in the axial or vertical direction. This is unfortunate as in the cyclotron, there is ample space in the radial direction, but very little space in the axial direction. We can see this experimentally. Here we see another long exposure pole demonstrating the Walkinshaw resonance with different initial conditions. The large turn-to-turn -turn spacing allows us to see how the vertical extent is double that of the radial extent. In this static semion simulation, meaning that the RF has been turned off, just one particle is launched with nearly the correct kinetic energy near its correct radial equilibrium orbit. We just let it execute the coupled motion in the Walkinshaw resonance. We see the ion fill the entire space. The different color regions are different particles with different initial conditions. Regardless of their initial conditions, they all follow the 1 to 2 radial to vertical ratio. We again can draw a one by two rectangle and see the ratio in the experimental observations as well. At this point, we've seen the entirety of the subsystems necessary to generate, accelerate, and deliver beam onto a target. In the next episode, we dive into the cyclotron's nervous system, the machine protection and control.